Sí, hola, buenas tardes. Encantado de poder recibirles otra vez aquí en nombre de la Institución Libre de Enseñanza. Vamos a seguir con nuestro, con nuestro seminario y hoy tenemos el gusto de tener a don Javier Solanas. Eh, Javier Solana, como todo el mundo sabe, es… Eh, bueno, no hace falta presentarte, sería casi… Sí, ya casi es, es completamente absurdo, pero bueno, todo el mundo sabe de su trayectoria política. <coughs> el año pasado lo tuvimos también en el, en el seminario que hicimos, más o menos sobre las mismas fechas, y recuerdo que su intervención fue tremendamente seguida. Al parecer eres, digamos, de las personas que han participado aquí en los seminarios, aquel a quien más se ha seguido luego después por internet y donde ha habido, donde ha habido más visitas. ¿no? Eh, fue un momento en el que eh, acaba de producirse la, la invasión rusa de, de Ucrania y por tanto, eh, digamos, eh, Javier, no tuviste apenas tiempo de, tuviste apenas tiempo de, 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 bueno, de digerirlo, como todos nosotros, ¿no? pero nos hiciste ya uno, nos desprozaste mucho nos desbrozaste mucho el camino, eh, diste pie también algunas reflexiones importantes. Hoy, to analyze uh, what was uh, what was happening in Ukraine, she just gave us some some clues. But it was just too early. The invasion just started. So we've decided to invite you again to engage in um, discussion between you and I instead of a formal presentation we will just have a, a dialogue between the two of us <clears throat> and I would like to uh, talk uh, about two topics first the war what are your views on current events And the second part would just uh, focus on the, the consequences, geopolitical consequences of what is going on in Ukraine right now. As uh, everybody knows, the New World Order is currently being rearranged, reshaped into new forms that we can only take a wild guess at. So we would really like to know what are the possible scenarios as a result of this situation. So I would like to start uh, talking about the war itself. And I will ask the first question. One year later, what do you find is more surprising about the events in Ukraine? <coughs> one year ago, no one really thought that Ukraine was capable of putting up such a fight. But no one really knew that the European Union was capable of facing the shortage of supply of Russian gas, but the European Union has, has managed to, to do so. <clears throat> so what are your views on that, Javier? Well, thank you very much for the invitation for the second time and thanks to you, Fernando, because you always think of me for these events. Well, the question is quite easy to answer and uh, quite difficult to answer at the same time because Well, one year has gone by, and when I think back, well, one year 
it's it's quite uh, difficult to to believe. It seems that not so. It hasn't been so long. I attended the Munich conference that took place uh, three days before the invasion. The invasion uh, occurred on the 24th, and we held uh, the meeting three days before that on the 21st. And at that conference in Munich, very specific uh, decisions were made about what would be our response in case the invasion uh, was to happen. <coughs> well, there have been many surprises in the last year. First of all, Ukraine has put up uh, quite a, fi a fierce fight. And it's also quite surprising that Russia um, has uh, failed because Russia wanted to just uh, get uh, to Kiev, replace uh, Ukraine's government by uh, Putin-sponsored government, and that would be the end of it. But one year later, this has not happened. Russia's army is apparently not as powerful as many thought. And one of the things that I find most impressive is that a lot of generals have died, which is quite shocking to have generals dying in the battlefield because normally generals are not on the battlefield. They are just behind the lines, uh, handling computers, uh, managing uh, the military maneuvers. Nonetheless, a few generals have, have died on the battlefield, and this is quite a surprise. What is also surprising is the behavior of the UN. United Nations in two aspects. First, in their votes, two major votes have taken place in the U.S. in the U.N. about, uh, first of all, the uh, the behavior of, of Russia. Two votes have been taken on the issue with different wording, but it's basically the same question put to vote. 140 votes said that they approved uh, Russia's behavior, three did not approve, and the rest were just absten abstentions and not present. And I would like to focus on my comments on the latter. The number of countries who did not wish to vote on that issue was quite big, quite large. Many countries refused to vote. Of course, abstention is a non-choice, but the largest number of countries, or rather, the most radical uh, position in the face of a vote like this was just not even bothering to to attend to the to attend the voting session. So there is a number of countries who condemn Russia's behavior, 140, but there is also an important number of. Uh, votes against and abstentions. Nicaragua, Ethiopia, Russia, and Belarus were the ones who approved the behavior of Russia. But the relevant aspect here is the large number of countries that, uh, which abstain or did not even uh, attend uh, the voting session. I think there is some food for thought here. I think the Western world 
needs to take good note to analyze which are the countries which have abstained, which, have the, which are the countries which have not even bothered to vote. And we can make some con- draw some conclusions. First, if we uh, add up the number of people who make up the different uh, vlogs, the number of people who condemn Russia's actions is smaller than uh, the, uh, those who abstain or do not vote. So the world is uh, very much divided in this sense. Well, in theory, of course, most of the countries represent uh, uh, their own nationals, but if we add the number of people, there is a larger number of people who voted, uh, plus those which abstain, voted no, and they are much more numerous than those who voted yes. So, if we, if you focus on the number of countries, then it, uh, there is a majority of countries who condemn Russia. But if you take a look at the number of citizens, Russia, China, India, etc., they make up a, a, a large percentage of the world's population. And the second uh, surprise, the th- second event that I found surprising is the very uh, low profile of the UN in this conflict. The Secretary General of the United Nations hasn't even visited Kiev or Ukraine. And that is quite surprising. Well, of course, he gave a speech at the UN Assembly, as it is customary, but I found it really striking that the Secretary General, or the UN in general, did not make an effort or took an initiative to try to, to stop this conflict. If I had been Secretary General of the UN, I think I would have visited Kiev, or any other Ukrainian city in Moscow as well, and then I would have visited a few other countries to just send the message that the most relevant international organization in the for world peace, well, is taking charge, is is, is doing something. <coughs> That it was quite surprising for me. Or rather, these were the two surprises. The votes and the very low profile of the, of the UN, the very the, the, And also I was surprised by the poor, Russia's poor planning of the war. They thought they would just uh, take uh, Kiev in a couple of days. They would just uh, uh, put a puppet government in Kiev and that would be the end of it. Alas, this did not happen. <coughs> I have also been very pleasantly surprised by the behavior of the European Union. I expected it, sort of expected it, because I had met uh, with the com- with the Munich Conference Group, uh, with the presence of the European Union, the U.S. The Germans uh, had a clear idea of what they were going to do. But I was very pleasantly surprised by the role played by the German Chancellor. 
I am no friend of him. I've just met him on a number of occasions. I'm no friend of him, but I've been um, very pleasantly uh, surprised by his behavior. In my opinion, he has uh, <coughs> acted with a great dignity. Of course, the UN would find it difficult to have uh, resolved the conflict, but I thought that they, the UN should not have just uh, uh, forsaken their responsibility to try to, to make peace. Of course, international organizations need to respond to the desires of, of the nations. Uh, otherwise, they will lose their respect uh, of all. Well, there, there, there is talk about negotiations now to try to end the war. One year ago, you said that there were probably some negotiations on the pipeline with the China as a potential mediator, but apparently uh, this has not happened. There have been no negotiations. Nonetheless, uh, many intellectuals like Habermas, many political groups, uh, demand uh, request a negotiation. Do you think there's any chance of these negotiations taking place? And what would be the possible uh, outcome of uh, these negotiations given the complexity of the situation? Well, let's call things by their names. This is a war, and wars end in two uh, different ways. One prevails and the other loses, and one party prevails, the other loses, or there are negotiations that l lead to an agreement. In this case, it is very difficult to guess who's winning or losing. <clears throat> Maybe the Russians will mobilize better uh, troops, uh, better uh, equipment, and they will sweep through Ukraine. I don't think so, because the, Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainians uh, putting up quite a resistance. So this is quite unlikely. So the only way out, in my opinion, is some sort of negotiation. But what kind of negotiation? Well, <coughs> first, of a, first of all, uh, one has to lay the ground for the parties to be willing to negotiate. Well, we already know that the Russians have uh, uh, published their claims, uh, 12 uh, claims. Other politicians, Lula, the Indian president, uh, have made some statements about the negotiation. I've had a long conversation this morning with the Indians. They were not so optimistic about uh, the possibility of negotiations. Nonetheless, due to the lack of a positive response by the Chinese, because, of course, China had a role to play, and when China has a role to play, they just put a document on the table, but uh, this has not been very well received. The Secretary General of NATO said that uh, that document uh, was uh, pointless. <clears throat> so apparently there is not a great 
enthusiasm about the possibility of negotiations. The most enthusiastic party was uh, President Zelensky, who said that I'm just willing to, to, to go to China to discuss this document. But I don't think there's any willingness to negotiate from many of the parties. In Russia, they don't know uh, what is going to happen, how will they react, <clears throat> what will be the military actual capabilities after uh, the renovation of the uh, of uh, the uh, military high ranking officers and generals i think nonetheless there is uh, some possibility of negotiations well some say that this will end up just like uh, the Korean War, a split between North Korea and South Korea. That is far from ideal, because as, you, as we know, North Korea has <clears throat> nuclear missiles. We don't know what they are willing uh, or prepared to do with them, whereas South Korea is a very developed nation, as, as, as we know. Well, there are many conflicts uh, going on in the world which are ongoing. Syria and Israel war is not ended. Uh, the, there is just an armistice, a long-lasting armistice. Could this be uh, a permanent armistice? Maybe. But in this case, <coughs> Russia and Ukraine, the, the, this is a problem of borders and the and the line of the armistice would be exactly the drawing of the borders. So it's going to be very difficult to negotiate a, a, a final uh, conditions for an armistice. If an armistice line is drawn, this would indicate what would be the final line uh, agreed in the negotiation. Of course, the, the, the Ukrainians would also have to say what are they willing to negotiate and what are and where are they willing to draw the lines. But I think both parties will have to concede something which means, of course, what, what happens with Crimea, Crimea, the Russian influence parts of Ukraine, etc. So there is very little I can say. The clandestine conversations between intelligence services are not really advancing much. They only have orders to, to engage in a conversation, but they do not even have a, a draft of a plan. I agree with what Lula proposed to look for a group of countries who would take a step forward and uh, propose to be some sort of a contact uh, uh, group. Uh, in 2014, uh, Russians took uh, Crimea and there was a group called the Minsk Group who negotiated about Crimea, but no agreement uh, was, was reached. The European Union was not a part in these negotiations as such, and the same applies to the U.S. 
So it was, in my opinion, too small of a group uh, and had no bargaining power. But this uh, was a failure. It was Germany, France, Ukraine and Russia. Now, uh, now but France and Germany were the only m major parties at Minsk at the time. So this could have been a beginning, if you like, but never the final uh, negotiating uh, table. But I think uh, we have to insist, uh, emphasize the possibility of a negotiated solution, at least to stop the war. But, uh, of course, there must be some sort of uh, an agreement about what is going to happen if the war stops, otherwise it will not stop. And there's another mm, aspect of the increased aid to Ukraine by the Western countries. The war is the war in Ukraine is in its current condition because everyone wanted to avoid the war from escalating into a full-blown war, a true world war. And no one wanted that, and everybody is just trying to take steps to prevent that from, from happening. So people uh, uh, say, well, let's keep this a Russia Ukraine war. Well, Russia and against Ukraine and uh, the uh, and Ukraine's allies. And I think uh, this uh, support from uh, Ukraine's allies will continue as long as the public opinion doesn't turn against their governments. There might be some countries in which there might be some doubts or hesitation about you know, the duration of the war, the expense. Some Republicans in the US are saying that uh, uh, too, ma too much money is being channeled into Ukraine and they cannot afford it. In the EU, in the EU with the exception of Hungary, most uh, other countries have expressed uh, their willingness to continue to support Ukraine. But of course, uh, we have our own problems. We have a, a rising inflation, uh, fortunately, the price of energy has plateaued, but we don't know whether it can <coughs> rise again. Economy is growing uh, slightly more than it was growing some time ago. China is growing at a 5% rate of GDP. And the defense expenditure is growing at 7%. This is making the economy grow, and therefore some prices go down, but not all. And then we have the problem of the so-called global south which is struggling because of uh, the cost of living, uh, hunger, because Ukraine was uh, one of the leading global food producers, the price of fertilizers is going up, etc. So everything that has to do with agriculture, agricultural products, the price of agricultural products is going up. And this is uh, creating some problems. <clears throat> In the so-called global south countries, 
uh, which are suffering hunger and lack of food. So this is one of the effects of the war in Ukraine, uh, the effects of globalization and, and the lack of uh, sensibility of many. Okay, let me just move on to the second uh, part of uh, this dialogue. The geopolitical consequences. You've talked about the global south. We will talk about Europe later, but Biden emphasizes that this war highlights the conflict between democracies and autocracies. But I think uh, it is not as simple as that. The world is far more complex than that, I believe. Are we witnessing a, a reorganization of the international order? Are we entering into a new paradigm? Who would be the most active uh, players. Uh, there is a fight for he he hegemony between China and the US, which is also present in the conflict, but there is an increasingly relevant role of countries like India, who do not want to be pushed towards the West, uh, uh, and it is the largest democracy in the world. Latin American countries, due to the geographic situation, are not so much aware of, of what is going on in Ukraine, but, but uh, China is extremely uh, active, if only as a result of its uh, presence in Asia. So what's next? Because I'm, I'm sure that this war will speed up some uh, processes that were already ongoing before the war. So before we talk about uh, Europe and Spain, what do you think is going to happen next? Well, I think it's too early to, to tell where are we headed. Well, clearly we are headed towards a world in which the West will have to <coughs> recognize that there are other countries uh, with different uh, living styles, uh, uh, lifestyles, and, and we have to coexist uh, with them. We really um, need to, to have an open mind. We must accept uh, that we have to coexist with other lifestyles. And uh, we're not really that flexible sometimes when it comes to coexist. For instance, the Iraq war. Well, we should just think about the repercussions of wars like the war in Iraq, unnecessary, absurd, based on false uh, pretenses that uh, was very disruptive of society and was completely useless. Well, it wasn't completely useless because this led uh, to the formation of many terrorist groups that were active in Syria and elsewhere. So it had a, a very negative aftermath. Well, I think, and we do have a part of that responsibility, we must try to make a more hospital, hospitable world to everyone. We need to, to, to understand, to communicate with each other. 
And of course, uh, there are ways to 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 deal with with the others other than than arms, for instance, commerce, which is uh, currently going through some difficulties because some of the rules of trade, international trade, are being just violated. The uh, U.S. has uh, placed a veto on Chinese imports of sophisticated technological products. So this is a way. This is a, a way of not uh, accepting to 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 engage in a in a much uh, needed uh, uh, conversation. Uh, and well, there is very little I can add because we always say the same things and we repeat the same ideas over and over. Well, I must uh, stress once again that we must do whatever it takes to engage in a conversation, a conversation that has to go all the way. We really have to discuss all the topics, all of them. Taiwan, for instance, if we close our eyes and, and we say, well, uh, this is uh, over, well, there are issues like Taiwan which are still uh, open and, and unresolved. So we do have many difficult conversations that we need to engage in. So it would be very important to engage in in such a relevant conversation. President Biden met with uh, uh, President Xi Jinping at the last uh, G20 meeting. There was a, an agreement about a meeting of of the ministry, the ministers of foreign affairs. But then we had the balloons, the crisis, and that was used as an alibi just to cancel that meeting. So we missed a, a quite an important opportunity. And the ministers did not meet as a result. Well, if we take a look ahead, on March 17th, 2024, there will be presidential elections in Russia. And in November 2024, there will be U.S. presidential ele elections. So one year from now, next year, we have two extremely irrelevant events for all of us. Elections in Russia, elections in the U.S. <clears throat> Would it be possible to, to find a solution before uh, the Russian and the U.S. elections? I don't know. Maybe they will try to reach an agreement before their uh, electoral campaigns, or maybe they will just uh, forego this and continue with their positions. Well, uh, there are doubts about whether President Biden is going to be a candidate, is going to run for next year's elections. He says he will run, but there are doubts as to whether he actually believes uh, that he's going to run, but there are many doubts about the age of the president uh, who, who, who believe who, who people believe is just too old for the office. 
And the Republican candidate will be uh, nearly 80 next year, so both are very senior citizens and there are doubts about their appropriateness for uh, the office. But right now the U.S. society is clearly torn, is divided. They only have one point of contact, hatred for China. That's the only area in which, the only ground in which both sides, both parties agree. So the Chinese know that there will be very little change uh, regardless of uh, who wins the elections, the Republican or the Democrat candidate. <clears throat> Nothing will, will change for them in this respect. So this is a very complicated situation. Am I pessimistic about it? No. I am uh, optimistic, but to a certain extent, because I think, uh, well, you can always find uh, solutions to the problems. As a scientist, I think that every problem uh, can have a solution. Shall we talk about Europe? Because I am quite concerned about the relation between the NATO and the European Union uh, during Trump's mandate. The relations between both uh, uh, were very damaged, but Brexit also damaged, uh, uh, the, uh, damaged it. Nonetheless, uh, there has now a renewed uh, presence of the Anglo-Saxon world uh, within Europe as a result of the war in Ukraine, who share the same fights, the same support to Ukraine. But do you think this may upset the status quo of the European Union, <laughs> the economist? Uh, uh, mentions a shift uh, towards the east of uh, uh, the uh, European center of gravity, uh, a greater affinity of the Baltic uh, countries with the US, not so much so with Germany and France. Does that mean that the south of Europe will just play a secondary role in the reconstruction of, of Europe? I'm sorry, I know that's a lot of questions, many of which do not have an answer, but there might be some consequences. For instance, the key role that Poland plays. In demographic terms, the population in Poland is quite similar to that of Spain. Thus, is there a risk that Poland uh, gains a more relevant role uh, within the European Union to become a fourth European power, as it were? I'm concerned about the possibility of the logic of war making us forget the, the validity of some of the principles that, that just uh, bring the European Union together. So the new role that Poland uh, could play, could this upset the balance? Well, I'm not uh, pessimistic about Europe, really. I have no responsibilities whatsoever, no, uh, anywhere, but I have uh, 
old friends whom I visit and I have conversations with on a regular basis. I think that the European Union has a quite an expected position. Just imagine of the possibility of war breaking out in Europe and uh, the European country will have to contribute uh, to fund uh, uh, the war. It is quite unthinkable that European parliaments will uh, approve such an expense. Nonetheless, war in Ukraine has broken out and uh, the European Parliament have been uh, willing to to provide funding to the war. I've seen the German Chancellor uh, tearing uh, the paper of the Nord Stream 2 contract. So I think all of the countries have uh, proven that they are, have acted uh, sensibly and they are they have shown that there's a great uh, degree of unity and the pandemic had a lot to do with it covid put the europeans in a situation of greater affinity with each other uh, don't forget the next generation packages uh, money that was being funded by the European um, funds for the first time in history Europe applied for funding from the market but not every country individually but as an institution as a unit and that was quite difficult uh, to imagine under normal circumstances applying for uh, requesting money from the global financial system uh, in uh, as, as one well that is that was quite extraordinary and vaccines as well yes there has been uh, quite a change in the, uh, the North uh, European North South relations just to resort to the markets collectively and the fact that the UK is no longer in the European Union has helped a lot because the UK would have probably uh, refused to do that. The thing is are we going to have some sort of uh, United Kingdom within Europe that is not really the United Kingdom? Well, Poland may fill in their shoes, but Poland does not have the capabilities or the military power to do so. I don't think Poland is going to play that role. They may try, but uh, I think it will be difficult for them to... to to achieve it. Well, it's true that many countries are quite concerned uh, looking when they look east, regardless of, of a war. Don't forget that Finland is, in, is a NATO member, which is unthinkable uh, for a, a neutral country. The fact that they have decided uh, with the support of the majority of parliament to enter NATO as a member is quite revealing of the fact that they think that there is a greater risk of war uh, from the Baltic countries, from the east. The south has a migration problem but the North has uh, a war problem, and war is a much more serious problem than migration. 
So the countries in the north of Europe may play a more relevant role as a result, but in general, I think all of the European countries have really behaved uh, flawlessly. And they, I think that the Commission is playing a very, very serious and relevant role. The mm, President of the Commission is, is, is uh, doing an excellent uh, job. And I think this has really benefited uh, prestige, even though some uh, say that Europeans are slaves to the U.S., we are just doing what we want to do. I think we're doing things pretty well in Europe, even though I have been very critical of the European institutions in the past, but I think that if we stay very united, as it has been the case in the, until now, we will do well. Despite uh, the difficult relations with the US, well, President Biden, uh, needs Europe and we need the U.S. So this is a mutual uh, dependence. God only knows what the U.S. Congress would have done uh, if the uh, European Union and did not have such a strong presence in the in Europe. I know, as I've said before, that there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there will be um, elections in Russia and shortly after elections in the U.S. and the electoral campaigns in the U.S., as you know, are not exactly a very rational uh, battleground. Uh, one final question, and then we we'll take questions from the floor. Spain. What should our role be? Well, I think it's playing, Spain is playing... Uh, a very relevant role in the international arena. Just the fact that the president of the government speaks English changes a lot uh, in the arena of international relations. Well, it's, you know, quite positive to see the president of the government uh, walking around the gardens of the presidential palace, uh, engaging in conversation with foreign uh, statesmen without the need of an interpreter. This is being very positive. And uh, we, Spain, has made proposals to the European Union, which have been accepted by the majority of the uh, European Union countries. So I think that is quite positive. We are playing a very positive role. We are at the right place. And I think after Brexit, uh, well, Spain has gained uh, some relevance in the Euro European Union. Well, UK can be replaced by Poland, but maybe, but also by Spain or Spain and Italy. I'm not pessimistic about it, really. Spain has a great problem. Uh, south relations with Morocco, with Argelia. By the way, Morocco did not vote on any of these two votes taken on, on Russia in the UN. And there are other countries who did the same. Half of the Latin American countries uh, have just uh, either abstained. No, they did not even abstain. They did not even uh, attended the voting session. Well, 
As I was saying, we do have a problem in the south of Europe, a problem of migration. <clears throat> and we would have that problem uh, anyway, regardless of our uh, condition of European member. One of the problems we had was uh, President Trump's mandate. President Trump uh, visited the different Arab countries, asking them, what do you want uh, in order to recognize Israel? And uh, they all made their requests. And Morocco said, well, I just want you to recognize uh, Zahara as Moroccan. And, uh, well, uh, Trump accepted. This regarding the, the consequences that they, this would have for Spain and Europe. So, when President Biden was uh, elected, uh, tried to undo uh, that, uh, take a step back, but once you've taken a step forward, but it's very difficult to take a step back. As you know, every year there are military exercises uh, jointly by the U.S., Spain, and Morocco. And the Moroccans uh, requested that the military exercises would include the Western Sahara. Uh, it was impossible for us to, to, for Spain to accept that. The troops that abandoned Western Sahara, uh, of course, are never going to go back to Western Sahara for for military exercises or any other military activity. Well, we do have that problem indeed, but I think we do have a very, very good relations with European countries, excellent bilateral relations with Germany, a much better bilateral relation with France, far from perfect, but better. But I think our position in Europe is now better than it has uh, been historically. What about the other party in the coalition government? Well, I think uh, there are some very specific issues in the relation between uh, the government and its uh, partner in, in government. But, you know, as you probably remember, before we took a referendum on NATO, I used to say no to NATO, but alas, a few years later, I was uh, appointed Secretary General of NATO, of NATO. Of course, once you know about the reality of things, you may change uh, your opinions, but of course, uh, living is learning. <laughs> when you're young, you have a lot to learn. <laughs> okay. I would appreciate it if you could ask brief questions. <laughs> Don't try to make uh, uh, speeches, if you see what I mean. And we will also take some questions from the Internet, from our audience uh, on the screening, on the streaming. Good evening. 
Congratulations. That was really very interesting, just like last year it was. A very short question, very brief. Why has the European Union been so cold about the Chinese proposal, these 12 uh, uh, points that you've mentioned? Well, the European Union has not made an official statement about the China's the Chinese position, if I remember correctly. But the Chinese position has a problem. The Indians uh, say that. It must be recognized that Russia has just crossed national frontiers. In other words, that there has been an aggression from one country to another. But this is not the uh, this is not mentioned in the Chinese proposal. Uh, they, the proposal does not really recognize that there is some responsibility uh, of the Russians. But if we want to negotiate, we cannot just ask for everything we want on day one. It's going to be very difficult for China to tell Putin in public, you have made a mistake. You have broken Security Council agreements. You have uh, uh, put half of the world against you. They probably have told him in private, but never in, pu in public. The problem with the Chinese proposal is that it does not recognize the fact that Russia violated international law when it invaded Russia. More questions. Thank you very much. I just have one question. We have not talked about the nuclear uh, danger. I don't think there's a nuclear danger, really. Despite uh, some statements uh, by President Putin, but he did not mention them again after he visited Beijing and after the Chinese Premier visited Russia. Beijing does, does, doesn't want to talk about anything that has to do nuclear. I don't think there is a nuclear risk unless other agreements are violated. But I think that the Chinese have told uh, Putin, don't, don't say that again. Then. I think you mentioned the term coexisting. The, no, no, I've said the capacity to, to converse. <laughs> To, to establish a dialogue. Okay. But I think that uh, referred to different ways of life that we need to engage in a conversation with. Does that mean that the declarations of human rights 
of the UN uh, 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 are going to be abolished because in Central Africa, for instance, uh, cannibalism is a, a reality. Does that mean that we are going to give up uh, uh, trying to, to fight against the cannibalism? There are other barbaric uh, practices. Are we going to stop consider them, um, considering them barbaric and accept them as alternative realities? Or we, we, will we continue to believe that can, cannibalism is wrong, that uh, a female uh, uh, genital mutilation is wrong, or are we just going to give up on our beliefs? I think we need to continue to defend uh, our values. We have no reasons to give up on our values. And I don't think that the agreements that we may enter into we would give up on, on these uh, beliefs. Of course, we're not going to change China's regime. Uh, we don't have as, an, as a goal to, to change the regime in China or in Russia or in Congo, for that matter. I don't think we uh, need to change anything regarding our goals especially when it uh, comes to funda uh, fundamental rights. We're not going to try to change uh, a Chinese regime to try to <laughs> to, to do away with communism or or the Russian regime, it's the Russians who will have to uh, change the regime, not us. But we're not going to give up on our beliefs. Well, thank you very much for your conference, Mr. Solana. Um, I can, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Carmen Enciso asks a very specific question. What are uh, the three recommendations that you would give to the European Union in order to try to improve a dialogue and relations with China over the next 20 years? Second question. I did not understand the first question. So what would you recommend to the European Union uh, regarding its relations with China for the next 20 years? I would try not to have a conversation with China uh, over the next 20 years and not talk about the present. Uh, we could talk about the future 20 years from now over a cup of coffee or, or tea. Another question, one of the, the members of the online audience says that Eugeni Primozin, the leader of the Wagner group, the 
paramilitary group Wagner uh, made some statements, uh, making some uh, strong accusations uh, to uh, the uh, military, to the Russian military, who he claims have just completely neglected uh, uh, the Wagner group. And he also questioned the capacity of the Russians to, to succeed, to prevail in this conflict. So does that mean, in your opinion, that uh, it might be possible that Russia does not have uh, the right uh, military uh, capabilities to prevail. Well, I have nothing to say in response to the leader of a paramilitary group. I despise the Wagner group, and I don't think we should listen to what uh, uh, its leader has to say. Good evening. Could you tell us something about Sahel? Now, the, now, well, Europe is looking towards the east these days, but we have a problem in Sahel. Uh, France is withdrawing from Senegal, and we are at the expense of a whimsical neighbor in this respect, Morocco. What should Europe do to protect not only the east of Europe, but also southern Europe? And its very essence as, as uh, Europe. Well, Sahel is a very serious business which does not only correspond, is not only Spain's responsibility, it should be a European problem. And it's been approached uh, at a European level because it really influences, it has an impact not only on the southern European countries, but on the whole of Europe. And this is really a hot spot. Uh, Sahel is a hot spot today. There used to be French troops in Sahel, which have gradually uh, withdrawn. There are, is no intention to, 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 to have uh, troops on the ground. And no decision has been made in this respect, but this is uh, and uh, one of the topics that is on Jose Borrell's uh, agenda, undoubtedly. Good, uh, good evening. It was a pleasure to uh, listen to your dialogue. Could you... Mm, could you give us your views on the role of Germany? One year ago, Chancellor Scholz uh, made a very promising uh, speech, uh, uh, heralding a change of era, but apparently they have not yet uh, paid uh, the 100 million uh, that they uh, committed to to send to Ukraine. There are um, differences of opinion. There are two uh, major sides in the public opinion. Habermas, uh, the intellectual Habermas, has also uh, had also had something to say about Russia, as you've mentioned. 
uh, whereas others think that Germany should increase its uh, presence and its uh, and its uh, aid uh, to Ukraine and maybe the more relevant uh, role that Poland can play is related to um, the low profile that, that Germany uh, has adopted. Well, that's one of the first things I've said today. I'm very satisfied with what Germany is doing. I think uh, Germany has uh, really taken a great turn in their positions. But uh, Chancellor Schultz told uh, President Biden, I've committed a spend of X million in defense, but uh, it cannot just be uh, spent uh, uh, in a one off. It's not just like buying uh, a dozen of roses. You must have the companies who have the capacity to produce, etc. And if we have to, to spend a lot on defense without uh, having a great capability, we'll have to end up having I think Europe needs to be very careful uh, with not having a single supplier of defense. We must not have a single supplier, as would be the case if the U.S. was the only supplier. We cannot make the same mistake as Germany did when uh, and they had was one one single supplier of, of gas. We can, we can buy one plane, but not 10 fighter planes, because that will prevent us from developing and having our own European fighter plane. Well, so you have to think uh, hard about these things. Uh, I shouldn't have said that, but I've, there, I've said it. And... Uh, we must also be. Uh, we must preserve our European autonomy. That does not mean that we are not going to buy uh, from one country or another. Uh, but we must uh, have a, a certain capability. For instance, Europe needs to have chips and we must have a, a, some sort of a chip uh, making company in Europe and uh, we need to make the effort to, to, to have that sooner or later. For instance, we have a problem with gas today. Tomorrow we'll have a problem with rare earths. Uh, the day after tomorrow we'll have a problem with penicillin or any other medicine that we don't have today. In other words, there are things that we need to start working on to have them. But you cannot just have them overnight. You have to plan uh, so that in a certain period of time we can have some things which are absolutely essential medicines. For instance, I think all countries must work on in the field of defense thinking of Europe on Wednesday I will go to the Academy of Artillery to talk to the cadets. 
and I will tell them, your role today is to plan for the Spanish defense with the European dimension. There is no longer a Spanish defense. We have European defense, and that's the way you have to think, and I'm sure uh, they will give me a standing ovation <laughs> when I say that. So I, will, I will get back to you and let you know if that was the case. Okay, uh, do you have any final question, Daniel? Yes, we have received a final question. Well, the European Union must uh, emphasize its efforts to approach Brazil or India so that uh, uh, they can just convince the countries to support uh, uh, the positions. What do you think about this? Well, Brazil will have a meeting with the European Union shortly at the same time when we will hold a meeting with all Latin American countries. Uh, during this first half of the year. But we want to hold a special meeting with Brazil and, if possible, uh, with Brazil and Argentina because Mercosur is a very important topic for, for, for them. And I think... Uh, Mercosur will be beneficial both for them and for us. Brazil is currently struggling. Brazil and Argentina, they're struggling. They are not in an easy situation. We will see whether Lula uh, is uh, capable of getting things done. As to India, as I've said before, I have been talking to, to Indian uh, this morning. India is uh, very willing to play a role in the international arena. I India does not want to be China too. It does not even want to be China 1, for that matter. It wants to be recognized as, as its own country. India uh, has uh, a not very liberal government uh, in office at the time. Nonetheless, India will soon have more population, greater population than, than China. Uh, they have very good technology. They don't have arms, no, though. Uh, they buy arms from Russia, and they also receive Russian gas at a discount price, but nonetheless, um, uh, I think uh, Russia, uh, India will play a very relevant role in the international arena. Okay, we'll take one final question. Thank you, Mr. Solana. I have a question uh, 
Hola un poquito más alto. Una pregunta en relación a lo que nos planteaba. In connection with something you've said before, uh, when you were asked about the possibility of a negotiation with Russia to resolve the situation. If that uh, negotiations occur, if at all, what would be the relations between the European Union and, and Russia after such negotiations? Of course, it will all depend on whether the current uh, uh, leader will uh, Putin will uh, still be president uh, after these negotiations or these elections. Well, I really do not have an answer to that question. In a few, in, in less than a year, there will be presidential elections in Russia. We don't know what's going to happen until then. And uh, apparently there are no alternative uh, candidates running for president in Russia, but we really do not know what is going to be the reaction of the Russian people to Putin's. But the most important part of the question is the uh, that uh, which affects the relations between the European Union and Russia. I think that Europe uh, really needs to do everything it can to have uh, relations with Russia. Russia is, uh, I mean, we really need to, 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 to engage with Russia for, for, many, for many different reasons. It's, it's part of, of, of our continent. We are neighbors and we really should start thinking about the shape of uh, uh, future relations with uh, Russia, regardless of who is uh, in charge in Russia or in Europe, for that matter. And I must apologize, but I have to defend uh, uh, Germany again. I think what Billy Brandt did uh, for the Oster politic was very, very intelligent and brilliant and very brave. The fact that this interdependence has uh, become uh, dependence, energy dependence, was uh, maybe uh, uh, an undesired result, outcome of the, uh, of the austropolitik. But I think we would need to engage in a new form of austropolitik uh, with this new Russia that will come out uh, of the elections. And uh, why shouldn't we engage in a conversation with, with Russia? I don't think there is any reason not to do so. Well, thank you very much, Javier. Thanks, everyone.